If your dog is experiencing reactivity, aggression, separation anxiety, resource guarding, other behavioral problems as a result of your dog experiencing frequent or chronic anxiety, then this video is for you. I wanna give you some reasonable expectations of what you can expect in your recovery journey with your dog. Here is the truth about what you can expect in your recovery journey working through anxiety. Let's get into it. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health. I'm a professional dog trainer. At this point in my career, I work exclusively with dogs facing anxiety related disorders. In my signature program, the Recovering Rover Program for Dog Anxiety, we coach our guardians through a six month program on how to treat their dog's anxiety related disorders. And I found a lot of trends in my plethora of rovers that I have worked with. Uh, and I think that the number one trend I find in guardians at the beginning of their recovery is that they don't have realistic expectations of what their experience will be like in the recovery journey. They perhaps have realistic understanding of what their dog experience should and will look like, but they feel a little like they're flying blind on what they can expect for themselves. So I wanna do both. I really want to address what are we doing when we're treating your dog's anxiety? What are the like, what is your dog's experience? What is the logistical training end of it? And what can you expect from you? What are the emotions you'll encounter? What are the obstacles you'll have to overcome? What will you be doing apart from actually training your dog? What are some of those outside activities that you'll be doing independent of having your dog on a leash? That's what I wanna get into in this video. The first truth that we need to address is that loving your dog is not going to be enough to get you through the recovery journey. If I had a dime for every single time I heard a guardian say, I just really love my dog, I would be a very wealthy woman. <laughs> and I think that's a good start. Like I want to be very clear that I think loving your dog is the foundation. It is step one. If you, if you don't have an unwavering, unconditional love for your dog, then you really should just consider rehome right out of the gate because treating anxiety is an obstacle. And if you don't have like the starting point of loving your dog and having compassion for your dog, you're not gonna make it through, okay? So loving your dog is definitely like step one, check that box. I think I'm gonna go ahead and assume that anyone watching this video would say, I love my dog so much. She means so much to me. He is my world. He is my baby and that is just the beginning. What it's going to take for you to actually work through your dog's recovery requires so much more than love. For starters, it requires motivation and determination once that motivation dissipates because motivation is fleeting and you will have waves where it comes to you and you're like, ah, oh, I'm gonna go training. And then you will have crashes and you're gonna feel like you've hit a plateau. And this kind of leads me into my first logistical tactful advice, which is that when you're actually treating your dog's anxiety, you're gonna need to be collecting data, period. I really don't know how you can do science-backed dog training and not be actually implementing any science. If you want to really be able to track your dog's progress, identify what are your exact dog's criteria. And I wanna be clear, I don't just mean triggers because there's a difference between a trigger and a criteria. You can say all day that your dog is reactive to other dogs, but reactive to other dogs is merely a trigger. It is not a criteria. In fact, being able to say, um, today I am working on dogs that are small, below, you know, beneath 15 pounds, black, and are walking parallel to us at 50 feet away. That is a criteria. That is not a trigger. And so being able to get into the nitty gritty of it, being able to articulate exactly what the criteria is of the trigger you're working with, and being able to measure that progress along the way is going to require you to implement data collection. You're going to need to have an efficient log. In the RRP, we call it the alleviate training method. You're gonna to need to create your own training plans. This kind of is something that's very arguable, I understand, but my point on this is if you expect only dog trainers to be creating your training plan, you will be forking out money for the rest of your dog's life. And here is why. Your dog's anxiety is not going anywhere. It's gonna be a recovery journey. There are going to be phases in your dog's life 
where you notice that the anxiety is is more intense than others. So for example, your dog has an anxiety disorder, you may work through a lot of issues in one house and everything is going swell in one home and then six months later you move to a brand new home and your dog has now new phobias. It's not that the training didn't work, it's that your dog has an anxiety disorder. Are you just gonna go find a new dog trainer again to create you a brand new training plan for these new phobias? What about a year after that? When your dog has manifested another anxiety inducing event, are you gonna go bring a new trainer for that too? Instead, you need to be learning how to create effective training plans on your own. You need to confront the reality that your dog has an anxiety disorder that is not going to just be cured in a matter of weeks, in a matter of months, and in a matter of willpower. In fact, your dog is probably going to be confronted with high inducing stress at different phases of his life forever. We would never say to another human, well, hopefully not in 2022, we would never hope to say to another human that if they are dealing with an anxiety disorder that they just need to get over it and that if they just do these one to three things, everything will be hunky-dory and they'll never experience anxiety ever again in their entire life. Everything will be rainbows and butterflies. We wouldn't really say that. And the same is true for dogs. You need to confront the reality that this is a journey that is going to be with you in some capacity for the rest of your life. And so the faster you can become skilled at treating your dog's triggers, at desensitizing your dog's phobias, at getting your dog to be more confident and comfortable in the world, the faster you can acquire that skill on your own, the less money you're gonna have to pay other people. It's just as simple as that. The less heartache it's gonna be because it's just a skill that you now have. You've acquired it. And we do this by collecting data, by understanding the minute information about your dogs. And I'm not just saying like understand dog behavior. I'm not just saying understand what a stress yawn means. I'm understand I'm saying what does it mean for your dog in this context at this time. A couple of weeks ago, I did a video on how to read dog body language. I will track that all here. It'll also be in the description box below. Highly recommend you watch that sooner rather than later because it's imperative that you understand how to set your dog up for success for the rest of his life, not just for the short term. And the way you do that is by knowing what your dog's stress and braver behaviors look like. Now let's talk about what protocols you'll actually be needing to implement in your dog's training. So for starters, it should always be rooted in counter conditioning and desensitization protocols. These are like step one, square one, science 101. If it's not rooted in counter conditioning and desensitization protocols, it's probably not science backed because counter conditioning is rooted in classical and operant conditioning. Desensitization is rooted in systematic desensitization. Both of those can incorporate ethology and neurological processes. So we need to be starting off with a science-backed approach. But what does all that mean? Because those are just big fancy words, right? What that actually means is that we are changing your dog's association of how he feels about that trigger. And we are giving him an alternative behavior to do in the environment when that trigger occurs. Because in many cases, in many anxious dog cases, it's not enough to just say, you're safe, here's a treat, rainbows and butterflies, and just throw the treats in the air and call it a day. I know that some positive reinforcement trainers do that. I don't recommend it because it doesn't actually change anything. It doesn't actually tell your dog what they should be doing instead. It is a two part process. We have to first change the association of the event and then give your dog an alternative behavior or behaviors to do in that environment. Now, when we are giving our dog the opportunity to display behaviors. I say behaviors plural on purpose. The first is that we want our dogs to be able to feel normal and most existing events don't require us to do the exact same behavior in the exact same way 
every single time we do it. Often there are subtle differences. We want our dog to express those differences. What do I mean by this? For example, if every single time your dog's trigger occurs, you put your dog in a sit, that's not realistic for the next 15 years of your dog's life. What if sometimes when a trigger occurs, you want your dog to just stand by your side because it's dirty on the floor, you don't want them to sit? What if you want them to loose leash walk? What if you don't want them to give you eye contact? Do you want them to go sniff? There's a whole you know library of reasons and, and ways that you can get your dog to do different behaviors. So it is important that we are giving our dog choice. Choice to be able to make a decision for himself and his body on what he wants to do with it. This leads me into my next logistical strategy for you, which is empower your anxious dog with the ability to make decisions. Not all anxious dogs are able to make decisions easily, and there are a lot of reasons for that, which I won't get into here. It's true that there are some dogs that are gonna be able to make decisions easier and more efficiently than others. That said, all dogs should be able to have critical thinking skills and have the ability to make decisions. And so if you're finding that your anxious dog is not confident in being able to make those decisions, the question is, why? How do we give our anxious dog those critical thinking skills? That is what you should be expecting on your recovery journey with your dog. Giving your dog opportunity to um, think critically about his environment, about his body, about his situation, and about what to do in those situations. Returning to a more um, mindset, emotional capacity for yourself and what you will need, and not so much on the logistical end, something that you're going to need my friend is a community of support. Something that I find all the time with guardians is that they do not really have a support system for what their experience is with their anxious dog. Now, they might say, oh, I have my husband or oh, I've got my kids. To be honest, there are a whole lot of reasons why that might fail and why they may not be supportive for you in the way that you think they will. But even if they are, they are too closely connected to the issue to be an outside objective ear. And in fact, if they are actually supporting you, if they are actually in it with you, they are going to need relief from that stress as well. And the reason is, is because working through your dog's anxiety recovery is a very emotional experience for you. It will have a roller coaster of emotions and Again, this is going to come back to how motivated you are, and even when motivation is fleeting, are you still very dedicated? Are you still pushing through? Are you still showing up? Do you still have the capacity to show up? Because perhaps you're running low on energy and on mental health availability. So instead, you need to have a collection or a community of people. One of the reasons why the RRP is a community is because when I was working with clients one-on-one -on -one and I was working with clients individually, I I realized I was not able to be their entire community. I was not able to provide them all of the emotional support that they needed. One, because there just wasn't enough time for that. But two, because the reality is, is that I have never actually owned and like worked with my own dog that had an anxiety disorder. And so while I have a lot of empathy and while I have been able to really listen to their stories and understand their stories, I don't quite have that sympathy component. And so in that regards, it's nice for them to talk to other guardians who are in the exact same boat as they are at that exact same moment. Guardians who are working through the same issues, guardians who have experienced uh, perhaps, you know, a week, a month, a couple of months ahead of the other person and they can say, oh, I just did that. I just experienced that. Here's what we did instead. That community, that collaborative effort is a sanctuary. It brings you safety. It brings you compassion. And it's not something that just one dog trainer can provide you. I implore you that if you are dealing with your dog's anxiety, that you seek out a program or an environment for that matter, that a community of like-minded individuals are together. Because if if you can collect people with similar values and similar philosophies and similar experiences to what you are going through with your anxious dog, you will find it is not as difficult for you to get through those low moments. You will find that it is easier for you to recover and be prepared for that next logistical issue. You have calmed your central nervous system and you are ready for that next logistical issue. Another way for you to connect with community is to follow my podcast, The Dog Liaison Podcast. While my YouTube channel is dedicated to all canine research and all canine behavioral problems that can occur, my Dog Liaison Podcast is exclusively for 
guardians of anxious dogs. All we talk about is anxious dogs on there. So I really implore you to check it out. I will have it linked down in the below. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, hit like, consider subscribing. If you hit the notification bell, you'll get notified when I drop a new video and I'll see you guys in the next video.